And we are live for a new episode of the Electric Podcast. I am Fred Lambert, your host. And as usual, I'm joined by Seth Wintraub, but this time live from Spain. How are you doing, Seth? I'm good. All right. It's a little bit late for him, so we'll try to get through this as fast as we can, but as best as we can, as usual. And we're going to start with something that I promised last week. I couldn't talk about it too much because it was under embargo. But I had the chance two weeks ago to go check out uh, the first production version of the ID Buzz and uh, do the first test drive in it in Copenhagen. And um, this, uh, I, this is a bit of a caveat with this whole first drive, first experience with the ID Buzz because it was the European version and the actual American version or North American version, I should say, that we're going to get is going to be slightly different and but not slightly different, a lot different, actually, because I, the biggest thing when I asked what you guys want to know about it is like everyone was like, I, I want to know what the third row is going to look like. We want a seven-seater and everything. Like, I understand that. Unfortunately, the first version that they're producing in Europe right now is, uh, is only a second row. There's no third row. It's a shorter wheelbase. And to be honest, I don't, I don't understand why they, they are doing that because they could do a third row in that shorter wheelbase pretty easy, I, I would think. Uh, but they are waiting for a longer wheelbase version, about 10 inch more. Uh, again, it's purely in the wheelbase, the over the overhang here, which are super short, uh, are going to stay the same. You're going to have a slightly bigger battery pack, and you're going to have that third row. Also, you're probably going to have the California version, which is the camper version. Though they didn't want to talk about that, they wanted to focus on on this because this is what they're going to deliver in the next few weeks. Again, only in in, uh, in Europe. Didn't, didn't have a, a strong answer again for why are they not bringing that uh, shorter wheelbase version to North America? Other than, of course, the North American market likes a bigger battery pack, more range, and everything. But this thing uh, gets a, a decent amount of range for 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 what it is. It's uh, this version it gets 423 kilometers. That's 263 miles but that's obviously on the wltp standard uh but still on the epa you, you're gonna get over 200 miles uh, on, on this um fast charging 170 kilowatts it's not top of the line but it's decent enough that uh, respectable it, yeah respectable for long distance travel and um now of course what people the first thing they, they see when they think that they think of that whole westphalia minibus from back in the days and there's clear design cues that takes you back to it. The first obvious one is the two-tone. Uh, one thing, one feedback that I've heard a lot from people like with the new version is that they, they think it looks cheap um, compared to the, the older version. And obviously, like now you have like body panels are not the same uh, material that they, they were back then. Uh, the interior, to be fair, the interior does have a decent amount of plastic. Uh, so that's might contribute to that feeling but overall i found the packaging to be to be very good like it's not it's not luxury level which for the pricing of that van a lot of people might balk at but the the i mean it's still it's a volkswagen it's going to be the most expensive volkswagen basically out there uh we're pretty close to it i, I would assume no it might be the most expensive volkswagen on the market now but the functionality you get from it is is very strong like you see here this is the back uh, with the the second row down, and you, you can see the harm rest on these sides here. Like it, it was built to have a third row, really. They just don't have that version just yet. But you can clearly see from that what the third row is going to look like. It and it's going to look like there's a lot of space. Uh, one thing I liked a lot in the inside of the vehicle is uh, USB C everywhere. You have eight USB C plugs all around the the vehicle, uh, from the back to the second row to the, the in the doors in the front row. Uh, the uh, sitting position is is awesome. Uh, something you would expect from a mini bus. You, you have captain seats uh, both on the front. You have armrests on each side, so it feels like a very relaxed driving position that I really liked. Uh, my main concern while while driving was was the field of view from a, a height perspective here. Uh, the that the roof comes very quickly <laughs> over your head and even though the overhang is short you still feel like kind of far away from from the front of the car uh, especially because of that um that roof coming in pretty deep uh the my main concern was that was if i was stopped at the red light 
and there wasn't one of those like shorter uh, at the bottom traffic lights. Uh, it was just the one at the top. You literally had to move forward and lean into your seat to try to see it and see when it turns uh, green. Uh, it did serve though as a pretty good contrast to like how comfortable this the driving position, the seating is that you had to move out of the of your way to, to check it out. Uh, no, I, I was really impressed with the uh, comf uh, the comfort inside the the driving experience. Now this is not like I'm used to driving performance electric cars that accelerate from zero to uh, 60 in like I mean three seconds for most for my own car, but most of EVs accelerate within five seconds at uh, around that time this thing accelerates to 16 like 10 seconds so it's not quick it only has one small uh electric motor the we i had the spec of the motor i think well that's that's staying true to the uh the bus heritage it's always been a very slow car yes uh, 150 kilowatt permanent motor so nothing to write home about but it, you still get this the the quick acceleration from a uh, very low speed like so so the acceleration from 0 to 20 or something like that and also some pep from when you um accelerate into a ramp on the highway for example uh this is uh, the you, you, it's not going to be a fun driver in that sense but you still get the little pipness of a of an electric vehicle it's more about the comfort uh, obviously with the minivan there was a um the uh you have the center display here the instrument cluster sorry very small but it gets the job done you have everything you need on it uh the bigger display you have 12 or 10 inch options and obviously you have this all the same problems that you have with the id4 and all the other volkswagen where the software is not quite what it should be yet uh volkswagen keeps reminding us that these vehicles are all software update capable over the air and it's going to get better over time. I hope so, because that, that's still one of my biggest downsides for not just Volkswagen, but any, any car that's not a Tesla, really. You have uh, Apple CarPlay on this, uh, which I, I enjoy, but I don't like the lagginess of the CarPlay. Like, there's, there's always, it's always a few, um, uh, not a second, maybe, maybe even a second behind. It's just yeah, far behind skip, enough that it's... You skip forward to a song, and then the song's still playing. For a second yeah. and then you want to skip again and you don't know when to you know you're actually at the song you're playing yeah and even you see it on the navigation where like it, it takes if if you have too quick move to do uh too quick next step uh when you, you actually done it in the, the the first step it takes a while for the system to switch to the next one because it hasn't detected that you've done it yet so those are are, are really annoying kind of, for me at least um but yeah. yeah, one thing you're one thing you're talking about a lot is the is the like the design. You know, it obviously looks a little bit more like a, a a truck, or it's got that overhang. And and the reason I think is obvious to some people is like you couldn't have the like the the you know '60s Volkswagen bus is super dangerous. Like your knees are basically touching <laughs> the front of the car. Yeah. So Volkswagen couldn't do like make that. So. You know, all these things like, you know, the visibility, the, you know, the look of it, that's all affected by safety. Like you have to make something in the front so that your knees aren't the first thing that, you know, there has to be an impact zone. Otherwise it won't pass safety test. So that's why it can't be an exact replica of, of the older one. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, but especially looking at the two side by side, like I was kind of reminded, like I actually might like the old one a little bit better in terms of the design, but uh, the, your yeah. explanation m makes sense. Um, I, I do understand that it looks cheaper, but um, I think I think the car has its own personality too. Like it's a, kind of a fun, upbeat type vehicle. Like it brings you, you smile when you look at it. Like it's not, it's not a boring vehicle that has some character, some personality. And um, and uh, I've seen that in the eyes of many people too. When I was driving this thing around Copenhagen, I saw that people with the first first time you look at it, I have some look of confusion. It's like, what is that? I've never seen that before. And then there's a smile on their face. Oh, this is kind of like uh, the old VW minibus. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's because of that, because of its own character and everything, uh, because of uh, all the possibilities that you can have with it from eventually the third row seat. 
uh, to a camper version to also available in a cargo version without anything other than the two front seat in the back. Uh, there's so much possibilities that uh, I think Volkswagen will sell everything they can make, uh, which is not a lot, to be honest. I think it's 15,000 the first year, and they plan to ramp up to 150,000 units in 2024, which is when we should see the, the vehicle hit the market in the, in the U.S. and, and Canada. So uh, there's, uh, there's still some hope that it's going to be early 2024, but it's, there's nothing, nothing's been made clear. A lot of automakers, obviously, in the U.S. have uh, their plans kind of uh, changed with um, the new tax credit and the, the eligibility criteria that are in it. Most importantly, the being built in North America and assembled in North America and then the battery components and the um, critical minerals that uh, goes into the batteries being from free trade countries and uh, or North America. So those uh, that likely change VW's plan in terms of the bringing the vehicle to the U.S., but I think it's gonna it's gonna still make its way there, just a little bit later. Yeah, do you think anybody's gonna import those? I've heard their plans of people like talking about that doing if if they could. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised, but it's gonna not gonna be any meaningful meaningful volume, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, this was pretty cool. Um, on Monday, on Labor Day, I went and hung out with Sylvain Juteau, who, um, if you're from Quebec in the EV community, you have to know him because he's obviously he's the OG electric vehicle guy in Quebec uh, from rouleelectric.com. And uh, he, uh, he has the best electric toys out there. The guy has just this uh, fleet of electric vehicles that's just awesome. And... Uh, in this case, he might be the only guy in the world that has both an electric pickup truck, the F-150 Lightning that you see here, and an electric jet ski or any kind of electric motorsport vehicle here because what we did with it was, was pretty cool where I wanted to for him to give me an experience of like what it's like to be um, an electric motorsport owner with a pickup truck for a fully zero emission experience uh, from door to door, from door to uh, to, to, to a lake or a river in this case. Uh, to really, yeah, anywhere. And um, it's really cool what you can do with the F-150. Of, of, obviously, what you would think is like, okay, I can tow that thing zero emission from my house to wherever I want to use it, drop it into the, the river and have my fun, bring it back. It's completely zero emission experience. But with the F-150, you can take uh, it a step further because of uh, the, the bi-directional charging capacity and in the back, especially where they have the uh, 240 volt outlet in the back that you can literally charge an EV level two with it. So we've seen a few people since the F-150 launch a few months ago that they charge a Tesla, for example, uh, or they, they, they charge another electric vehicles with it uh, because of course you have also a massive battery pack in that F-150. But what Sylvain does, uh, and, and this was like a, not just for show. This was a real experience that we did. So we show up uh, at this uh, at the river here in the St. Maurice River, just 20 minutes outside of Shawinigan. And we um, we uh, road, I guess road is the name for a jet ski. We used the jet ski, the Tiger Orca, for, for about 30, 40 minutes, uh, me and my girlfriend, and uh, just have fun on the river with it. And then when we came back uh, for lunch, it was... The, it was down to like 35 percent capacity uh it goes down pretty fast if you put it on we, there's three modes with the orca there's a range mode uh which you could probably use it all afternoon if you wanted like a, a half a day with it uh on range mode which is still pretty fun sports mode if you want to go a little bit crazier on it and then there's wild mode that doesn't limit the output at all which was completely insane we went 90 kilometers an hour on water with it it was it was crazy um that drains the battery pack real fast when you do that. Uh, so we got the, the vehicle out of the water, uh, put it on the trailer, and then Sylvain used a wall box, uh, charging level two charging station, plug it into his F-150 uh, Lightning and into the, uh, the Orca, and you can charge it while driving. So we, we plug it in, we drove to... Uh, well, back to his land because he wanted to show me his other electric vehicle toys, which are pretty awesome, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about those later. But 
then we drove we went to lunch we had lunch and then we were able to get back on the water with the vehicle charge up to like 87% or something like that within the, an hour or less than two hours probably you can see in the uh, f-150 lightning center display you, you go to pro power on board tool and you can see exactly everything all the outlets what they are outputting so in the circuit avant which is that's inside the cabin uh, which you can you can draw up to 240 uh, 2400 watts to 2.4 kilowatts uh it's drawing 100 watts right now but that's because you had the cooler plugged in inside uh to nice. french drinks but the A and B here is a two phase in the back that can uh, draw up to 2.6 uh, kilowatts. Uh, so we were, we're drawing basically the max right now, around uh, seven kilowatts. And it was charging the Orca at 6.4 kilowatts. So there's some loss getting to the, to the Orca. But still, it's, it's uh, I mean, the F-150 has enough battery. You can see here 182 kilometers you had left. And um, what's great about not just the 450 but all of ford's electric vehicles like the mikey they are very good at range prediction or i should say not even very good i should say uh conservative they're very conservative with their range prediction so you can count on them so there's not range anxiety in that sense uh, sylvain came he lives in trois rivières he came from trois rivières about 60 kilometers away from uh, our uh, the location where we put the ark on the water so he drove he drove there of course, 60 kilometers will draw more than the average than than 60 if you, we weren't towing something in the back. But uh, this 182 kilometers accounts for the fact that he's on tow towing mode. Uh, so that's that's very useful. You can uh, put, draw, I think, the 24 kilowatt hour battery pack that you have in the Orca, and you can charge it basically twice the Orca in a single day and still drive home. Uh, to his house in Trois Rivières, and then where he can plug in his car and charge with solar because he has solar. So, a completely zero motor, zero emission, solar powered motorsport experience from getting the uh, vehicle to enjoying it in the wild. Um, I was, I, I, I think this is really the future of electric motorsport, really. Now, did you notice um, any degradation in the acceleration or power? Of the F-150 while it was charging the thing in the back? Uh, I did not, but uh, to be fair, we didn't do anything. Well, actually, we did something pretty pretty hard because we uh, we went on this dirt road or this gravel road all the way up to his land where he showed me the electric ATV. And uh, I was pulling the Orca while doing that, and it was completely effortless. Now, we weren't doing it at high speed, but, uh, but still, we I mean... It's pulling seven kilowatts out of it, so I don't think it's gonna draw that much power away from the battery pack into the the drivetrain. Um, right. But it's it's a fair point. And and the Orca, I and I I gotta say it again. I know I'm I'm invested in Taiga and everything, and I don't want to sound like I'm just a shill here, but this thing is just it's so fun. It's so fun. It's it's fun because like you can do everything. You can do like uh gasoline jet ski you can go crazy with it and we did go crazy with it like i said we went like 90 kilometers an hour which no one should be able to do in the water but this this is the coolest part to me it's this thing here so this is pretty incredible right now because can you hear that sir we yeah. are yeah, next yeah. to national park here saint Maurice, and we are on the taiga orca all electric watercraft sort of like a jet ski that you I'm, this thing is working right now. I'm, I'm obviously I'm going like five kilometers an hour or something like that on the water. But if you were doing that with a, a gasoline powered jet ski, uh, it would be still quite loud. And uh, no, idling it would be loud. Yeah, you, yeah, you're right. Even idling it is super loud. Uh, so in this case, you can truly you can both have your crazy fun with it, and you can enjoy the the wild without disturbing anyone. Uh, and yourself really better enjoyment when you're, you're not being loud. So I'm really impressed by this machine. I think this is really the future of uh, electric water sport. Just hope that he can ramp up production because right now yeah. there's probably like a dozen of them in <laughs> out there. And what do they cost? Uh, they're going to start at 17,000, I think, but that's um, that might be Canadian uh, or US. I'm not so sure. That's not uh, crazy. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not more expensive, really, than a regular jet ski. 
and uh, it's just so much better experience. Also, like, you know, you, you spend a whole day uh, on the water with a gas in jet ski these days. It's going to cost you like $50, a hundred dollars of gas. Uh, yeah. This costs you like two dollars not even right. of uh, electricity uh, all right this this was a big deal this week uh gm uh did they launch i don't know what we call that but they they, they already had unveiled the car really yeah but not, um the pricing so and the specs i guess yeah so in addition to giving us some of the specs and, and continuing to say that they were going to launch at around thirty thousand dollars um, they actually showed it off in New York City. So um, uh, Fernando, the nine to five Mac guy, and I uh, trekked out there on my way to the airport to come to Madrid uh, and actually saw these things in person. And we're going to have a video up shortly about that. But um, it's it's a pretty impressive car. Like uh, for thirty thousand dollars, like it kind of takes on the ID four, uh, maybe the Mach E, you know, they like low end uh, Model Y. Uh, and it, it's also interesting that they have a rear wheel model, a front wheel drive model, and an all wheel drive model. So you can have any configuration you could probably think of. And are are those also uh, all available with different battery pack? Okay, I I, I know the like I'm looking at there's the two different thing. packs. Yeah. I think. So you have the one LT that comes with standard with front wheel drive and the smaller battery pack. Right, and then you have you can have front wheel drive, I assume with the bigger battery pack, yeah, and then the all wheel drive, mm, only with the bigger battery pack. It looks like, yeah. Okay, so no, so there's just okay that that's how they get the pricing down. I think so. The the the, the smaller battery pack is only available for the one LT right. with front wheel drive. That's right, but okay, that's. 250 miles is still respectable. Oh, it is. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm just. I'm just saying like I. I do like when they go like they, they give you the options for everything because you 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 you'll, you get a lot of people that would want like yeah, I would want the smaller battery pack with the all wheel drive for example, uh, which mm -hmm. is gonna give you still probably 210 miles of range something like that. Yeah. Maybe even 220. Like that. That's still good, and that would probably reduce your price. Uh, you you could probably get the 34 thousand dollar version. Uh, all wheel drive instead of uh, um, they, they haven't they haven't released the, the price in details, right? They, these are just yeah. the pricing, the, the base price, base price, basically the base price, and then the the release the trims for the other version without revealing right. the pricing. But I mean, if if this version starts at sorry at thirty thousand dollars, I would assume that uh, you still get um, the bigger battery pack with front wheel drive for probably 35 or less. Yeah, so and probably that, some other package additions. Yeah, so that you, you could you could probably get a 300-mile range vehicle for $35,000 here. That's what it I sounds so. like to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it sounds like to me. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, like the 2LT and uh, 3LT, uh, those are uh, not just... The, well, you all have the bigger battery pack in those, and it's either front wheel drive or all wheel drive. And um, but you also get a bunch of other things, including uh, different interior options in terms of color, uh, power adjustable driver's seat. Yeah, the one LT at thirty thousand dollars doesn't have uh, power adjustable uh, seat, so it's really basic. Um, you have options for roof rails. You have options for a bigger center display, 17-inch center display. Yeah, that's a really same one that's on the Blazer uh, SS. Yeah. That's their kind of like wraparound display. Oh, okay, yeah, like yeah. Also, um, I should note that uh, the Equinox and the Blazer and the Silverado have vehicle to load capabilities. Um, the Equinox and Blazer are going to be able to put out three kilowatts, which is, you know, that's kind of enough for a lot of homes. So that's a little bit more than uh, Kia and um, Hyundai's uh, EGMP plat platform, which is a little over two kilowatt. So GM's coming pretty hard here with with the, these features. Yeah. Um, you know, you could you could back up your house, you could go camping, you could do all that stuff. And I don't think that's going to be on the thirty thousand dollar one but you know as a upgrade it's nice to have. yeah it, 
did they tell you that? I don't see that in the. In the yeah, it's not. Thing. It's not in the uh, press release, and it's it's weird because like that's the coolest thing you can, you know, in a base model vehicle like this, and that you know they just it just kind of skipped their minds that they that they should include that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, oh, yeah. and it's becoming like a feature that sort of have to become standard for a lot of people because with with the way that Hyundai has approached it, with the way that Ford is approaching it now, uh, yeah. only like Tesla is really the one that's not getting on board with this yet. Uh, but they said they would with a cyber truck uh, and going forward. So, yep. No, it's uh, GM is starting to 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 get in some skin in the game here, but uh, obviously, yeah, so, so this is next yeah. year, though the available. Yeah. So next year, spring, GM has the Silverado launch. Then fall, sorry, summer, they have the Blazer SS. And then fall, about a year from right now, they launch the Equinox. Or you can start delivering Equinox. Yeah. So this is a big year for GM. They, uh, 2023 should be pretty big. Yeah, obviously, especially the Equinox would only be uh, later in the year. I don't think we're going to see big volumes from them. No, but the Silverado and the Blazer should have some decent volume. Yep. And one other thing is, um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, this is kind of just like the new Bolt EUV. The Bolt is way narrower than this thing because of the size of the battery and whatever. The Equinox is a different car. Like it's it's a much bigger, like interior wise, it's huge. Also um, use the Ultium powertrain Ultium, technology. Right. It's not the old generation that the EUV and EV are stuck with. Yeah, so um, it's not the same car as the EUV, and and they kind of hinted that the EV might not go away uh, the second that the um, the Equinox comes out. It might stick hmm. around for a little bit. So a little bit, maybe. <laughs> yeah, a couple years. It's also maybe. a better looking car, to be honest, than the EUV. Like uh, I'm, I've never been a big fan of the Bolt EV or any. Or you EV know, I love the Bolt in terms of the design, but. Uh, the Equinox is much much more solid design, and the Blazer is even cooler looking, I think. Yeah. All right. Rivian uh, made a new friend this week. Uh, Rivian announced that uh, they are launching a joint venture with Mercedes-Benz to uh, to build an ele two electric vans, actually. It sounds like one's going to be branded Rivian and the other one branded Mercedes-Benz. In Europe, they're going to leverage an existing Mercedes-Benz site in Central slash Eastern Europe. Uh, to build a new uh, a new all electric uh, production facility, and as part of that, um, let me let me see exactly here. The co the company envisage production optimized vehicle designed for efficient manufacturing on common assembly lines. So the the vans are going to be built on the same line. They will aim to produce two large vans, one based on the van EA MB van electric architecture. Uh, the electric-only platform of uh, Mercedes-Benz vans. If that's hard to say, Mercedes-Benz vans. And the other based on the second-generation electric van, uh, Rivian Light Van RLV platform. So it's a new. It's going to be a new platform for Rivian because, of course, Rivian already produces the electric van for the uh, Amazon delivery vehicles. And now they're going to produce a new one based on the second generation of that platform. And of course, Mercedes is kind of one of the leaders in electric vans, especially in Europe with the, uh, the what's it called? The uh, EB, uh, MP, uh, MPV? What was that called? I don't remember. Yeah. Oh, the, wait, the G... Uh, sorry. No. Yeah. They also have the e uh van. They have the uh, Via Vio, Vio van. They have a bunch of uh, electric vans out there, mostly a commercial yeah. vehicle. And it, this this does sound to be commercial, by the way. It's not going to be like a consumer van. It's going right. to be a commercial uh, commercial van. Um, it's an interesting oh, yeah. e partnership, that's for sure. EQB is, is the van, the electric EQB, van. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this is, but this is kind of... Uh, Reminding me of uh, Rivian's deal with Ford. Uh, so when Ford first invested in Rivian, they talked about doing a joint venture and building a, a pickup truck together, a pickup truck branded Ford. So, of course, that ended up not happening <laughs> because uh, obviously Rivian should do, did the right thing and focus on their own 
production and bringing their vehicle to market. Like they somehow thought that they could do that and also produce electric powertrain for Ford to make their own pickup truck. It was kind of a very ambitious. Um, but something similar that what Tesla did early early on. But that was um, did Tesla ever had? Yeah, no, they did have production early on with the Model S at the same time as they were producing the powertrain for the Mercedes B Class Electric and the smart so this is sort of the partnership with mercedes around that time too to be fair uh but yeah rivian uh kind of was a bit over its head over its head uh when, when it comes to that i think and now now this is gonna hopefully in the, in the next few years is gonna come to fruition so i think this is kind of a more an easier way for rivian to get into the european market uh with a partner and so i think that this deal makes a little bit more sense to me than the ford one Yep. All right. All right. This was our biggest post of the week, of course, because it was it had Donald Trump in it. Um, this is kind of a bummer to me because uh, I, I think it, electric vehicles is such it would be such an easy kind of subject and an easy goal that both sides could focus on and make it happen. It's it makes so much sense to just cut oil uh, consumption. It makes so much sense also for like the next. For the economy, because you, if you have a strong electric vehicle, uh, not, not just market, but also like industry, uh, it, it's going to dominate. It's going to be a, a force for the economy uh, if you, you get all the way down to battery production, especially, and then the charging infrastructure. And, and this, is, this is a giant opportunity for the U.S. and for North America to sort of uh, reclaim a lot of the manufacturing capabilities and, and, and capacity that was lost to Asia over the last uh, decades. But it's, uh, it has, it's still, by some Republicans, not all Republicans, but by some Republicans, and now Donald Trump getting on board, it's, it's a problem because whether you like him or not, he's extremely influential still. Um, <laughs> I wrote I wrote in a post saying that way. I mean, you might get a laugh from that. Uh, I wrote in a post that... Uh, is uh, Trump is undoubtedly as an extremely strong influence on a large part of the population in the U.S. And I had one of our copy editor that was editing the post came back to me is like, "Is that true? Should we leave that in?" I don't think that's true. I'm like, "You, you haven't been in the South anytime soon." Like the guy yeah. is extremely influential, not just in the South to be honest. Like he has fans all over the place. This was in Pennsylvania, and I mean, he, he drew a crowd of like, I don't know, like tens of thousands of people there. It's know, wild. So whether you like him or not, he's influential. And he went on a rant that just included a lot of misinformation about electric vehicle, which is a bummer because with his influence, I think it's going to re re uh, result in, in increasing the divide between uh, uh, like making making electric vehicle like an issue. Okay, it's just for the Democrats. The Republicans are not on board with electric vehicle, which makes no sense whatsoever. And I, I brought up because he started out the speech saying that uh, basically laughing at the Biden administration for going all in on electric vehicles, saying that back in his day, they weren't doing that. They weren't going all in on electric vehicle. But I pull up a quote from him from 2020, so not that long ago, uh, where, where he said that I'm all for electric cars and I've given big incentive to electric cars, which of course wasn't that true. It was just... Uh, he was referencing Obama era EV incentives, uh, but it's it's worth pointing out that when it was convenient for him, he was taking credit for electric vehicles in the U.S. And especially when Ford and GM and all the American automakers were announcing big investments that were resulting in jobs creation uh, in the U.S., that uh, he was taking credit for that, even though it was obviously more about the uh, just ele the electric vehicle industry booming and the automakers having to react to it. <laughs> so uh, then he, I won't get into the too many details. You can read the post if you want, because he, he went into this kind of anecdotal anecdote about uh, a friend of his that apparently bought an electric vehicle and had a terrible experience with it and asked him, I, that friend apparently reached out to him and asked him, you have to shut that down. You have to shut down electric vehicles. This is this is bad. It's, I just, I just cannot imagine a scenario where, unless that this friend like happens to work for the fossil fuel industry, or something, like, that is, that that would make sense. But I cannot imagine anyone 
just buying an electric car and having like a bad experience enough to them that and that they know Donald Trump that they would reach out to them and say shut that thing down Sh- that EV thing you got to shut that down this is dangerous <laughs> so wait, are you saying Donald Trump was not being truthful uh, I mean I, I have no evidence of it but I just I, I it makes no sense whatsoever for me well his EV got 38 miles to the gallon according to Trump so yeah so JB said that the, the, he was referring to hybrids there but I reread I re-listened to the comment and to me it sounded very much like he was still talking about the electric vehicle and he made he made it clear that a guy bought an all electric car too like that was right. his, his whole thing he said that before that he was into the hybrids and whatnot but um Keep I mean, in mind, you know, this this is the same guy who had Mark Zuckerberg at the White House a week ago. So maybe not everything he says at face value. What? Say that again? No, so Mark a, week ag- a week ago at a rally, Donald Trump said that he had Mark Zuckerberg at the White House a week ago. Which so he, has he, cl- he, he thought like he was at the White House himself a week ago? Even I though guess. he hasn't stepped foot in there in two years, right? <laughs> okay. He might be uh, having some issues. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you guys in the U.S. have some really top, top shelf <laughs> candidates here for for in, in terms of the the top okay. echelon of your politics. Not that we're much better. <laughs> well, at least uh, at least the people that you elect like could could probably walk around the block without you know. Help. Uh, without amphetamines and right. <laughs> all, yeah. whatever Trump is taking. Yeah, I mean, the the real bummer is like I just don't want him to make that an issue of like red versus blue. It's just it, it makes no sense. This is an issue that both sides can rally on. And even if you're not ready for an electric car, I get it. You, you, you might you might think you're not ready. Uh, but and honestly, also, if you don't buy new new vehicles, if you you buy used cars, like you don't have to be ready. This is the especially like the whole people who are concerned about the mandates, the like the sales ban on on gasoline powered cars by a certain date. Like this, first of all, they're not anywhere close <laughs> to that, uh, unless you're talking in decades. And this is just for new car buyers. I, I have so right. many people that are like, ah, I don't want, I don't want that, I don't want that. Like, I don't want a new, a, a new electric car and everything. And I'm like, when's the last time you bought a new car? It's like, I never buy new cars. I only buy used cars. And then it's not even that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it. It's not even about you. That it's a very small population, uh, part of the population that buy new cars. And those are the one we're after right now for the, for electric vehicle adoption. It's just, it just works like that. It's not. It sounds elitist for some people, but it's just it's, it's how it works. It's new car market that are driving everything. So uh, that's how you have to approach it. Speaking of the new car market, I'll just address one thing that Trump said in one of the misinformation. And he said he said that electric cars cost twice as much as a gasoline powered vehicle. I mean, we just reported on that a few weeks ago. We had the data from new car buyers in the U.S. The average transaction price for gasoline cars was forty eight thousand dollars. Uh, and for electric vehicles was $66,000. So certainly not twice as much. It is more for sure. But you have to take into account that that average for electric cars is not broken down per segment. It's it's broken down just a, a total average of electric vehicles. And uh, we have a lot more electric vehicle options right now, unfortunately, at the higher hand of the market. So uh, in, in the like luxury and mid-luxury sedans, for example, and crossover and all that. So obviously the higher the average is higher, but if you go per segment, it might be a little bit higher, but not that much. Certainly not twice as much. All right, then uh, some Tesla news to end the week. Uh, then after that, we're gonna get into the comment section. So if you guys have any comment, any questions for us, for us, put it in the comment section right now. We're gonna get to them in a few minutes. Also, if you do enjoy, enjoy the show, please give us a thumbs up uh, on uh, your whatever app, streaming app that you're watching right now. That helps the the show tremendously, and it's free to do, and it takes a second to do. Also, uh, if you're listening on a podcast app, if you can give us a five-star rating, that helps the show a lot. And we've seen a few recently that it really uh, that came in the, after the last show and the one before that, and we, we read them all, and we appreciate them. So keep them coming. It's uh, really appreciated. Also, tell your friends. Yeah, if you if your friends are into EVs, uh, we are the show to watch. Uh, yeah, even though I'm a bit biased, just a bit. All right, uh, this uh, Tesla is planning to build a license to print money 
<laughs> that's what Elon is calling it. That's what Elon is calling uh, basically lithium processing, uh, lithium refining facility. So basically a, a cattle material facility. Uh, so Tesla has been talking about that for a long time. I mean, not even forget about the battery day before that. Do you remember I said in 2014, Tesla tried to buy a, a lithium startup that was based in, um, what's it called in California? The, um, it's like the, the snowy pass or something. No, the sea, the, the, the Salton Sea, is that the Salton Sea? I want to say. Oh, Salton Sea, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the Salton Sea, they tried to buy it, but it didn't pan out. Uh, so they, they've been looking for like a decade, really, to get into the lithium business. Of course, uh, at the Battery Day 2020, Tesla basically announced that they were getting into the lithium business by buying a, a mining claim, like a 10,000 acre mining claim in Nevada. And uh, also, they were saying that they were going to process that lithium themselves with a new, with a whole new process that's going to be a, a lot more. A lot less energy dense, a lot less water dense, and uh, more efficient. Uh, that has yet to happen. In the meantime, <laughs> the price of lithium shot up like four hundred percent, and um, and Elon has been calling it quite a few times for people to get involved and like you should get into the lithium business because the demand is extremely high and production is not ramping up fast enough. And he's completely right about that. A lot of people have listened to him. By by the way, like uh, I listed a few companies like. Uh, that are, are in the lithium business that are building new capacity right now, like Lithium Americas, Standard Lithium, Liven. Of course, you have also giants like uh, uh, SQM and uh, 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 Albernail. Al Albern oh, I forget the name. Albernail, I think, is probably the biggest in the world right now. Uh, so there's a lot of people that are increasing the capacity, but simply not fast enough, which is why the price are shooting up. And Elon, has, Elon said, so it's basically like mining money right now. There, I'm, I'm quoting him. There's like software margins in lithium processing right now. So I would really like to encourage, once again, entrepreneurs to enter the lithium refining business. You can't lose. It's like license. It's like a license to print money. <laughs> and uh, so the news this week is that... Uh, Tesla has applied with the Texas controller's office uh, to filing for asking basically to uh, some relief on local property taxes in uh, on the new lithium battery grade lithium hydroxide refining facility to be built on the Gulf Coast of Texas. Uh, in the filing, Tesla says that they could start uh, construction as soon as the fourth quarter, uh, aiming to reach production by the end of 2024. So it'd be a quick turnaround for Tesla here. Within two years, uh, they would uh, they would start production, and the construction could start by the end of the year if the project is approved. So it makes uh, it makes a lot of sense. You're gonna you're gonna see a lot of those announcements, I think, in the coming months from Tesla and from uh, other companies uh, that um, a lot of lithium processing is gonna have to happen in North America too. If you want to have that tax credit, that yeah. tax credit is really working. <laughs> I know. I, like, I've uh, seen, I've seen, I don't know if you, you're seeing the same thing said, but the number of announcements these days about just production, new, new production capacity down the supply chains, all the way to the, like the mining, all the way to the processing, all the way to the vehicles themselves is it's out of control right now in North America. Uh, like we're talking like tens of billions of dollars being invested tens of thousands of jobs being created at a time where there's already a later uh, a labor shortage there's already like record low uh, unemployment in most places like this is uh this is kind of an interesting boom that's happening i think like that's, that's like i know people are all talking about the recession and whatnot but like if you're in the ev market right now you just you're looking at some unprecedented level of investment right now yeah i was surprised to hear uh magna uh we did a story this week on Bagnet coming to the U.S. They have a facility in up, uh, Upper Michigan, but they're going to build like eye paces and theoretically uh, Fisker Oceans and all this stuff that they do there. Everything they are involved in overseas that wants to get access to the tax credit right now. Right. A tax credit is working in terms of like creating job areas. Like this might be one of the most successful subsidies of all time to create jobs in the, it's, in the mean, U.S. I for us, it seems like it. I mean, yeah. Magna is also rumored to be working with Apple on their car, so uh, yeah. could be a big deal. Yeah, I was. Uh, I did an interview this morning on the Montreal uh, radio show, and talking about the possibility of Tesla building a factory in Quebec too. And 
like uh, subsidies that wouldn't be involved in everything. And I, 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 everyone, especially in Quebec here, that we're almost socialists, not quite that, like we're obviously still a capitalist <laughs> economy, yeah. but some socialist tendencies really, and people don't like any kind of uh, subsidies to corporation. But I keep, like, we cannot worry about that here. Like the job growth that it's going to bring, it's going to be massive. I try to hammer that in because any kind, especially I don't think Tesla is really much looking for big incentive in terms of tax breaks and everything like that for the gigafactories. I think their main concern is like, let me build it fast, please. Just right. those environmental, environmental assessments and everything like that, just turn your head. <laughs> let me right. like sign a big X on them and like it's done. Which isn't always Check great. It. Like that's not a good Obviously. Uh, precedent. Yeah, obviously, I'm not saying it's a it's a great idea, but if uh, if you can at least just streamline the process, making making quick and then done, like everything is always a bureaucratic nightmare when when the government is involved. Yeah, and you know the the obvious the flip side to the argument of like you know why are you giving these huge companies huge tax incentives? Two things: one, they're competing; you're competing on a global market, so you're competing against Texas and places that don't have taxes. So it doesn't really give you a chance unless you give some sort of subsidy. And the other thing is you're bringing so much business to the area and creating so many jobs that the tax base is going to go way up anyway. So, I mean, that's, there's, there's arguments to be made on both sides. I'm not yeah. totally for either one. Yeah, I agree. I mean, one of the things that the host asked me this morning is like, uh, he's like, between if it's between Ontario and Quebec, Quebec has been extremely supportive of electric vehicles, while Ontario has been the contrary, like crazy. Is like does that give us more chance to get the factory in Quebec? Is like, like no, look at Texas. Texas, exactly. <laughs> Texas is was is worse than Anti. Ontario when it comes to electric vehicles. And Tesla not only dropped billions of dollars to build a factory there, they moved their headquarters there. So right. I don't think they care one bit about that. As long as, um, as long as they can do it fast, yeah, they're that's the in. only thing they care about right now. Um, speaking of Gigafactory, Gigafactory Nevada, we had some very interesting numbers uh, this morning, thanks to uh, CNBC. The uh, the obtain uh, uh, recordings from a, a meeting that happened this week at the factory from the new leadership. So Chris Lister, guy that came from PepsiCo and has been leading the factory there for for quite a few years now, has exited. And he's being replaced by, oh, Lord, help me. Yoshikesh mm -hmm. <laughs> Sager, I think. Yoshikesh Sager. Let's Hello. call him Mr. Sager. All right. He's the Senior Director of Vehicle Operation and Manufacturing Engineering. He was the head of uh, Gigafactory, uh, sorry, Fremont Factory. Why are we not remain, renaming Gigafactory, Fre Fremont Factory to Gigafactory Fremont <laughs> like the rest? Um, yeah, he uh, he was in charge of that. Now he's in charge of both factories, and which kind of makes sense because the main role of Gigafactory Nevada is to supply power trains and battery packs to Gigafactory uh, to Factory Fremont. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm 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 calling it now Gigafactory Fremont. That's what we're going to call it going right. forward. Um, yeah, so he during that meeting, he's just sort of sort of introducing the new leadership of the fa factory and everything. And then he uh, discussed the goal of the factories and released some very interesting numbers. So announced that uh, Gigafactory Nevada produced 283,000 drivetrains during the second quarter. Uh, that was a record. Uh, so they're nearing 300,000 drivetrains per quarter out of here. Uh, said that uh, they have a steady output of 18, uh, 8,800 high voltage battery packs for vehicles. And uh, they want to ram that up because uh, they say that uh, Fremont Factory, uh, Giga Factory Fremont is producing 12,000 cars per week right now. And they want to ram that up to 14,000. Uh, so the discrepancy here, I would assume, is the LFP pack uh, that are coming from China, or at least the batteries are. Uh, so that, that might explain the difference here. And on the uh, stationary energy storage front, uh, very significant output from, from Tesla here. They have a capacity for 42 megapacks per week, which doesn't sound much, but when you look at a, a megapack, you would understand that it's actually quite a lot because uh, uh, they, they produced about, they were producing 34 a week on average last quarter. So that's also a great increase over the last quarter. So they are going to have like a record output this quarter. 
uh, Q, Q3. Same things for Powerwall because they produced 37,600 Powerwalls in the second quarter. And now they're talking about an output of 6,500 per week. Uh, so that would put the output closer to 70,000 Powerwalls per quarter now. That's, that's, that's a lot. Uh, which makes sense too, considering that Elon just earlier this week announced that uh, Tesla might reopen Powerwall only orders by the end of the year. So right now it's only combined with uh, solar uh, because the demand is so strong. But uh, by the end of the year, it might just open. Yeah, I didn't understand that because uh, Elon tweeted this week. It was like, hey, uh, I assume it was in response to the energy crisis right now in California where uh, they are in danger of having some brownouts. That he was like, hey, if you are afraid of burnouts, just buy a power wall. Uh, but it's not just buy a power wall, it's buy solar and power wall too. Uh, though obviously it makes sense to, to buy them together. Uh, but Tesla is limiting the availability of it. I mean, here in Quebec, we, I know like dozens of people will have one on order and it just for years now and Tesla is not delivering them. So with that higher output, I would assume that also it means higher availability in other markets where Tesla is just not reaching right now with the with the power walls. Yeah, but yeah, some rare uh, data coming out of uh, Tesla here. Yeah, that was a strange one too. The um, Tesla is gonna let you vote on supercharger locations. So uh, if you're not following the Tesla charging and uh, account on Twitter, so it's an official account called Tesla Charging. Let me it's see verified. if they added. Uh, sorry. It's verified. Yeah, it's verified. It's a legit account. And uh, they do post some interesting information. They do post like every single new supercharger that opens too. So like there's a new one here in Allen, Michigan. And uh, one in China, Yantai, Shimo. <laughs> in China now, they do all of these with the, this little uh, thing that prevent people from uh, parking there if they're not, uh, if, they, if it's not a Tesla vehicle. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. It works with a QR code straight from the app. Um, but yeah, they announced that they're going to let you vote on... Uh, oh, sorry, I, you cannot see. <laughs> I was showing people on the screen, but I just realized I wasn't, it wasn't on the right screen. Um, my bad. So they're letting people add right now to this tweet that, the, that they posted. You can add a location, and then Tesla is going to add it to a voting system soon where people are going to be able to vote on specific location. Uh, I don't know what's the goal of that exactly because I would assume Tesla already has all the, the best data to know where they would need to put new supercharger station just from their, their vehicle data. And uh, it's the, the best tool to, to determine where a new station needs to go. But it looks like they want some input from uh, from the user. So obviously, a lot of people come with their biases, including myself. I want, I want one in Shawinigan. Uh, Seth came out with I uh, wants one in Bennington, Vermont. And... Also, maybe one in Chatham. Yeah, it's uh, just nearby. nearby. <laughs> so go vote for Seth. Oh, Seth, you have thirty likes on this one. You might, uh, you might end up on the on the list there. I mean, you look might... at the look at the big void there. You can see yeah, like there's the big square. Is there, is there a big highway here? No, because there, there's two main oh. highways. One one on one, one in Vermont, and one in one in, in New York, and. It's not a big highway, but like uh, during the you know Friday night when every everybody from the New York City area is going uh, skiing and snowboarding in Vermont, mm -hmm. like that highway is just packed. And it really New York City, that's about four hours away, so you're starting to run out of charge there, and you don't want to you know get to your ski place with yeah. that may not have a charger uh, with nothing. So putting one in Bennington or even Manchester uh, would be huge. Mm -hmm. I did that road. Well, what's that highway here on, that goes through Albany and goes through uh, to Lake Champlain? Uh, 80, I don't remember. 85 or something like that? Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe 84. 84. Um, yeah, it's a nice uh, nice drive. Yeah, I did it two weeks ago. I was, I was stunned by how nice of a drive that is. And supercharger, why? If you stick to that highway, uh, so that would be like if you want to go to Montreal from New York or vice versa, that, that there's no problem. But yeah, on the Vermont side, it's a little bit... Uh, trickier a little thinner yep uh oh yeah mega pack too like we, we just talked about the gigafactory nevada having a capacity for 42 mega packs per week but uh mega factory in latrop california where tesla is going to solely produce the mega pack uh it's uh it's starting to ramp up because tesla has uh, posted a, a bunch of jobs uh, they're doing they're going on a hiring spree for the factory 
And um, that factory is going to have 40 gigawatt hours of capacity per year to produce the mega pack. So that's a lot more mega packs than 42. Uh, just to quick comparison, Tesla has deployed four gigawatt hour over the last 12 months. So that's 10 times that output that the factory alone would increase. And um, it looks like Tesla is starting to ramp up uh, there with a, a big hiring spree. Can you call it a mega factory if you're producing gigawatt hours of batteries? Yeah, it's good. Starting, to up, upgrade. starting to get confusing, but I mean, you, you cannot use the giga factory uh, name for this one because I, even though it's a huge output of mega packs, it's actually not uh, that big of a factory if you compare it to Nevada, Texas, or, or Berlin. Yeah, and we're going to start hitting terawatts pretty soon. Terawatt hours. Yeah. Terra factory. All right. Let's uh, go into the comment section. Alrighty, uh, 55, all right. Let's move quickly here. Cars, jacks, not plugs, all right. Mr. Fun Guy. Uh, Dan Oberst, uh, I'm 6'3", almost always have to lean forward to see traffic lights. We're talking about the VW ID4, or sorry, ID Buzz. Um, that overhang is a downside. Um, yeah, I don't know what you do about that because there is an aftermarket product that you can buy to put on the corners of the windshield that would actually be able to help you look, give you an angle, like some kind of mirrors. Uh, so it's not like a lost cause or anything like that, but yeah, it's annoying. All right. Question. What can we do as EV advocates to encourage vehicle to grid technology? Uh, Adam Wilcox asks, uh, would support legislation in Canada or U.S. to require the onboard inverter to support vehicle to grid in light of recent power peaks in California. I mean, you know, the capitalist market will will kind of point people in that direction. Mm -hmm. If you have two similar cars and one has a vehicle to grid technology, uh, vehicle to load or whatever, you're certainly going to go with that one. Um, but yeah, I think uh, legislation could hurry that along. I mean, it's also, you know, the electric companies have to be on board. Uh, we saw this week that the LEAF uh, got its first, I mean, that was like after four years. We saw that thing in LA. Remember there was some event Nissan had at the LA Auto Show like four years ago? Yeah, with Fermata, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, Fermata, yeah. And that thing just got uh, um, UL listed or whatever mm -hmm. uh, this week. But, you know, like you have to have a plan with the uh, the energy companies and there's like, 600 different electric companies in the u.s so yeah it's a lot of work we'll yeah there. exactly there's a lot of uh players that need to come together to make it happen but to be fair too i'm also not completely sold on the usefulness of it on vehicles like the vehicle to grid like i i, I like more the idea of vehicle to everything so the idea that you can output from a vehicle is nice for like camping situation for like power tools on uh, commercial uh, a construction site on uh, what, whatever. There's plenty of application for it. Um, for an actual heavy load of powering your house or like sending back to the grid, uh, that's that's going to be trickier for a lot of people where they might not want to do that. However, if having the capacity on your, on your vehicle is not that difficult to have and some people would like it and that would help the grid tremendously then yeah it would make maybe it would make sense to uh have legislation being involved i but for things like like school buses that that makes a ton of sense for me like a school bus doesn't get that much use uh mm -hmm. especially even especially during hours where you would need it uh like in the evening like past 6 p.m where when do you see a school bus past 6 p.m well between 6 and 9 p.m there's that's peak demand time uh, if that bus still has some power, then yeah, send it to the grid and then yeah. charge overnight during a low power mode. And that's incredible value to it. So things like that make a ton of sense to me. All right. Uh, moving on. Green Gold, LG and GM's Lordstown, Ohio battery plant has started production of the Ultimum ba batteries. Go Ohio. Yes, that's something that they uh, included in the uh, the um, Equinox $30,000 thing uh that's fantastic. uh they got to ramp up obviously but um there's gonna be a lot of battery packs coming out of uh lg and gm yeah 
continuing on, Chevy Equinox EV looks great for 30K. Do you guys know what trim will have the panoramic sunroof? Um, yeah, I know we, the higher, higher sure. trims will have it. Uh, is it? I think it might just be an option though on the higher trim. I don't think it comes standard. So, uh, okay, the L, the the 2LT, you can add it as an option. Yeah. So starting from the 2LT and the 2RS. Yeah, it's a yeah on everything. It's an option. So everything past the one LT, you can add a sunroof to it, but it's always an option. Yeah. It's not, and it, what one nice thing about the sunroof on um, both the Blazer and the Equinox is it has a shade, so you can, yeah. you, if you're in Arizona, you can pull the shade. Um, green gold with the Equinox being over only thirty k for the base. Do we really even need an EV tax credit? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're not going to be able to make enough of them for a long time. So I don't know. Yeah, it's a hard tough. But I, with, with the limit on the income that people can have this is starting to be a car that what would make sense for for lower income people like not again not low income people but lower income people to have access to a new car here does this one address me do you know anything about what motivate this guy trump does everyone really know other than like himself he's obviously a narcissist right <laughs> if biden is hugging mary vera these days what do you think he's going to say if you read electric zone posts on facebook or twitter the negative souls are coming out of the woodwork i don't know if they're actually souls or bots or what but... yeah especially arthur is on facebook like I, I do admit that on facebook we have like some of the like it's not manageable. Like we could, we try to moderate the comments there, but it's it's out of control. All right, uh, Stefan Frockjar, a lot of interesting vowels there. Sounds man, the ID amazing. buzz is yep. Man, the ID buzz is boring in comparison to the concept. Well, well, that you can say that about every every vehicle out there, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the 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 concept was cooler, but. It's unfortunate. All right. Spikes 43 question. Have you heard any updates Rivian might be offering for next year's models? Would love a 240 plug like the Lightning. So again, we're talking vehicle to load. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's one thing that I hear a lot from people that since the F-150 has come out, like the, the Rivian does look a little not as good because of that. Um, the F-150, especially considering like the whole adventure thing that uh, Raven is pushing, like it wouldn't make sense for camping situation and and for what exactly what we did with the Taiga Orca too. So, uh, but no, I haven't heard any specific on that. You know, when when I was at the R1S event um, in upstate New York, um, I talked to one of the engineers, and she said it would not be hard to make a 240 uh, output. Um, basically, they're they have a, a pretty strong one, 110 volt. Um, I think it's 20 amps. So 110 volts at 20 amps, you know, two k, uh, kilowatt. Mm -hmm. um, she said it would not be hard to replace that with a, um, a different inverter. And, you know, it could even be something that they retrofit older vehicles with because it's on a very powerful DC to DC converter. Obviously, you know, the batteries are, are plenty big enough. There's enough bandwidth there. Uh, to, you know, make plenty of power come out of that for long periods of time. It's just people need it. And I think that's going to bear out. Like, I think people are going to want it. So I would anticipate Rivian will do something like that. All right. Tyler Hilliard says, question, should Tesla have a question? No, no I, a think, I think Tyler, Tyler. Put, oh, wait, hold on. Yeah. There you go. yeah. He also put the and question I, again at the end, so might might be okay. the might be the one that has the the good phrasing on this. All right, let me see. Reservation holders asking if they want to delay delivery to 2023 for potential tax credit. That way, they could export more plus cut communication time. Uh, I mean, it's not a bad idea because I I think a lot of people no no but but here's the thing. I don't I don't know if it would have a massive impact on exports because how many with, with uh, how many people are going to actually be eligible to the, in 2023 to get the credit uh, because of the income limits and also 
we don't know exactly which Tesla vehicle are going to be eligible based on the uh, minerals and uh, assembly component uh, situation, uh, especially the also the price limits on the car, like the, the Model 3 would work with the uh, base version, but then the base version that LFP sells, which the sells most likely come from China, and then that would be eligible. So there's a lot, there's so many things that we don't know about uh, that uh, I don't know how useful it would be. All right, uh, David Parrish, are you going to do a report on the 4680s? Well, we've done a, a bunch. Yeah. I have not seen any reporting on if they are the million mile battery or even if they will be using a dry cell. Yeah, I mean, there was a report from routers this week about that. Uh, we did we did share the report with some of our own insight in there because the report was kind of strange in terms of uh, the way they described the source to the king weren't clear if they had inside sources or not uh but uh, yeah it sounds like tesla is still having some issues uh doing the the dry uh the dry cell format uh to to ramp that up to higher volume uh so no there's but but most experts in the report seems to think that this is going to achieve it they're just maybe not on their own timeline but you can say that about every single tesla project ever made <laughs> All right, I think this is the last one. Question, any comments on the next Tesla FSD beta 69 and 69.1 release? Uh, no, I haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. Uh, I've seen a few videos on it and everything, but to be honest, I don't... Since having the FSD myself in, my, in the car... I don't trust most people that post those videos because right. if you were to listen to those guys, you would think like this is the greatest thing that ever happened to the auto industry ever. And uh, for me, I still see it as uh, something that's quite far from what was promised. So I don't know. I'll wait until I get it and uh, I'll, I'll give you my honest opinion. It shouldn't be too long, though. Uh, uh, it sounds like Tesla is uh, rapidly expanding the that point sixty nine uh, to 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 the fleet of beta testers. All right. Uh, I think that's it. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening to the show. Uh, if you're still listening to this point, you're a real one. You're a real AV fan, and we appreciate you a lot. If you can give us a thumbs up on the stream, that would be great. It helps with the algorithm, and it's free to do. Same thing if you're listening on, it, on your uh, podcast app. If you can take a second and give us a five-star rating, that helps the show tremendously. Only if you enjoy it, of course. If you don't, it's fine. It's not for everyone. And uh, we're going to see you same place, same time next week. Have a good one.